Your Holiness, Your Grace, Lords, ladies and gentlemen, it's my tremendous privilege to welcome His Holiness here this evening on behalf of the, the hosts of this meeting and to say how much we're looking forward to your words tonight and how much we will be taking from them. We're, I'm very confident about that. Many people would say, having heard that you've come to address bankers and then MPs, that those are the two groups who are most in need of spiritual instruction in the country. <laughs> but actually, I think we're all in need of spiritual instruction. We're all in need of it. It is relevant to the big society and it's of wider relevance. And um, it's, I, I am just going to say today it's a great privilege to welcome you here and I am looking forward in a spirit of humility and wanting to learn. I am looking forward to hearing your words and I know that I will be taking something from them this evening. If I can say briefly on behalf of my, my, my co-hosts, I know that they are in the same frame of mind, my good friend and neighbour Richard Harrington I can't emphasize too much to you how interested he is in this meeting, how much he wants to be here, but he is being kept away. Detention actually is too mild a term. It's a sentence of imprisonment being on a bill committee. And if, he, if he's on this committee, and he is required to be there, mainly I would be letting the cat out of the bag if he said he was just there to vote, but I think you'll get the flavor of what I'm saying. Uh, but if he, if he wasn't there, uh, the government could be defeated, the law could be changed, and the, the powers that be, the government wouldn't be too happy about that. So he is very strictly being kept there, but he would like to be here, and if it's at all possible, I believe it will be, he will be joining us at some point throughout the evening, because I know that he is, he is as keen as I am and Matthew is to hear your words this evening uh, and to welcome you here on what I think is a, is a very important occasion for all of us, and we are looking forward to your words very much indeed. Timidandasya Gyananjana Chalakaya Chakshurun Militam Jena Tasmai Sri Kurve Namaha Nama Om Vishnu Padaya Krishna Pristaya Bhutale Sri Mate Bhakti Vedanta Swami Nitti Namane Namaste Saraswati Deve Gauravani Pricharine Nirvishesha Sunyavadi Paschatyate Sadharine Sri Krishna Chaitanya Prabhu Nityananda Sri Adwaita Gadadhar Sri Vasudhi Gaur Bhakta Vrinda Hare Krishna Hare Krishna 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 Hare 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 Rama Hare Rama 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 Hare Hare It is very difficult for me to express my sincere gratitude to be given the honor of being in the great House of Parliament to meet with all of you and share some of the words from my heart. As I'm standing here, I'm remembering 41 years ago, just where this window is where I used to be, right across the river. 
I was a homeless traveler, wandering the world, trying to find meaning and fulfillment in life. At that time, I lived for some time in London. There was a priest who opened the doors to the basement of his church for travelers like me to sleep on the floor. And that church was on Lambeth Road right across the river. And on that embankment wall, of the River Thames. Every night I would sit on it and look at the reflection of Big Ben, the clock tower, in the current of the river. And as I saw, I would meditate on what is really the best use of my time. How can I make the biggest and most important difference in the world? And where is the current of the river of destiny leading me? At the time I was 19 years old, I was born in Chicago brought up in a northern suburb and reached my teens in the 1960s. It was a time of revolution and turmoil in the United States. Here I was being taught as we would pledge allegiance to our flag, that this was a nation which was the home of the free. But just a few miles away, in the ghettos of Chicago, the African American people, in those days, if you're born in the poverty of the ghetto, 99% you will live and die in the ghetto. There was no freedom for people of a different color. There was very limited freedom for people who didn't speak our language. It was a contradiction. At the same time, there was a war raging in Vietnam. When you turn 18, you had two choices. You fight for something you may not even believe in, or you go to prison. There was a lot of questions. And at that time, there were revolutions, there were riots, there were demonstrations. The country was divided. I was part of the civil rights movement. I was part of the counterculture. I remember Martin Luther King saying, the irony of our times is we have guided missiles and misguided humans. And he also said, if you don't have an ideal you're willing to die for, you have nothing really very meaningful to live for. He was inspired by Mahatma Gandhi, who said, try to be the change you want to be in the world, you want to see in the world. And I remember thinking that the people who really seem to have brought about the greatest social change are those who had spiritual foundations in their lives. And I was seeing very clearly that the same things that myself and my colleagues were revolting against, we were the same, just in a different dress, perhaps with a different cause. 
greed, egoism, selfishness. This is what we were revolting against, prejudice. But we had the same thing. And I came to the conclusion, if I really want to make a difference in the world, I have to find a spiritual foundation for myself. So I began traveling to see how other people in different countries view the world, view God. What values do they have? And I saw so much hatred in the name of a loving God that I really wanted to search to find out, is there a common essence of all these spiritual paths that could unite us instead of divide us? That was my state when I was sitting on that wall in the River Thames looking at this great parliament building, thinking that much of the world's history's decisions were made within these walls. I couldn't imagine I would ever be inside speaking. I'm so honored and so grateful to all of you and for this opportunity. I didn't have money. I was trying to study my own faith very deeply, Judaism, Christianity, it's a long story, but eventually I hitchhiked from London to India. A few days ago, I spoke at SOAS, University of London, and I was kind of telling this story. And after my talk, a very nice young girl who was a student there, she told me that she was the president of the Hitchhikers Association of the UK. <laughs> and she was so inspired by my talk that I hitchhiked from London through Turkey, Iran, Afghanistan, Pakistan, all the way to India. And she said she wanted to do the same hitchhiking route. She asked my opinion. <laughs> I, I gave my opinion. I said, please, my friend, hitchhike to Heathrow Airport and catch a plane to, <laughs> to India. <laughs> it's much safer. You know, fasten your seatbelt, you'll get there. What took me six months now takes me eight hours. While I was in India, wandering around through the Himalayas and the jungles and going to different ashrams and learning from Buddhists and yogis and Baha'is and Sikhs and Jains and Parsis. I was trying to understand so much. In the Middle East I was studying Islam. At one time in Calcutta I lived for some time with Mother Teresa. I'll never forget something she told me. <coughs> That's special effects. <laughs> she said that the real problem in this world is hunger, not hunger of the stomach, hunger of the heart. She said, we can feed people food, and that's good. But she said, I traveled the world. I go to New York and Los Angeles and Chicago, and I go to London. And I see, even in the wealthiest, most powerful people, this hunger of the heart. She said, sometimes when the poverty-stricken, diseased people of Calcutta die in my arms, I see a sparkle of hope in their eyes. I rarely see that in the people of the West. 
She said that hunger of the heart, the only thing that could satisfy it is love. Things can give pleasure to the mind and the senses, but only love could give pleasure to the heart. And ultimately, that's what we're all looking for. And in her faith, she told me that the origin of that love is our love for God. And when we connect to that love for God within our hearts, we could be an instrument of that love in whatever we do, wherever we are. At the time, I had just come out of my teens, and I was deeply impressed by that concept because it encapsulated what I was finding to be the true essence of life and all the spiritual paths in the world. While I was traveling in India, I heard a very, very powerful analogy that in everyone's heart, there are two dogs, a good dog and a bad dog. The good dog represents humility, compassion, self-control, selfless service, fulfillment, love. The bad dog, envy, anger, selfish passions, arrogance, and these two dogs are fighting. Do any of you have that experience? Sometimes that bad dog is really howling, and the good dog is <laughs> can hardly be heard. In the world we live today, so often we are bombarded by the weapons of mass distraction. Which of the dogs is going to win this fight? The one we choose to feed. Every moment we have free will to react to whatever comes upon us. An actual character is to respond to whatever situation in a way that we feed the goodness of our heart. We feed the divinity within us rather than the envy and the anger and the selfishness. In our educational systems, Recently, I, yesterday at Cambridge, I speak often at Harvard, at MIT, at Stanford University, at Columbia University, and so many universities in India. Incredible! The sophistication of our sciences and our educational system. But if we actually want to make the world a better place, and give actual joy and fulfillment to our students and empower them to give the same to the world, we have to build the foundation of our education on universal values. One time I was speaking at a university in India and one student challenged me that religion, spirituality should be banned in every country because there's so much fighting between all of you and so much hatred and prejudice. And I gave my answer that that's based on not spirituality, it's based on ego, selfishness, in the guise of spirituality. The first commandment of the Bible 
He's told, love God with all your heart, all your mind, and all your soul, and love your neighbor as yourself, and every living being is our neighbor. That's a universal principle. We have to seek the essence. And then we'll see how spirituality can actually empower us and unite us. But then a few months later, there was Hindu-Muslim riots in Bombay. And I had to drive from a suburb to where our ashram is in the middle of the city. There were hundreds of buildings being burnt. There were corpses of slaughtered people on the side of the road. There was logs in the road to stop cars. I saw people opening cars. And if they were from another religion, they were butchered. I saw children with blood screaming. And I was thinking, I can understand why people think like that. That spirituality is really bad in the name of God, murdering, hating. But it's not about spirituality. It's about the bad dog putting on a spiritual dress. <laughs> spirituality is meant to feed the good dog and starve that bad dog. There's a beautiful verse in Bhagavad Gita. Vidyavanaya sampane brahmani gabihastini suni chaiva swapake cha pandita samadarshana. What is real wisdom? What is true knowledge? What is actual education? It's not simply about storing masses of data in our brain. From the Gita's perspective, real education is to have the wisdom to see every living being with equal vision. Whether one is black, white, red, yellow, brown, whether one is a Hindu or a Muslim or a Christian or a Jew or a Jain or a Parsi or a Sikh, or an agnostic, or an atheist, or even if one happens to be an elephant, or a cow, or a dog, or a cat, to actually honor, respect, and love the sacredness of life. According to Bhagavad Gita, mamayvam so jiva loke, that every living being is a part of God, a part of the divine. This is character. To learn to honor and value life. To love means to serve. Let us examine the human body. We have so many different components of the body. Every part of the body's function is to serve the whole body. It's not that the hand says, forget the rest of you, I'm going to enjoy for myself. It's not that the kidneys say, I'm in it for myself, forget you. You do your own thing. There's no prejudices. Every part of the body there's so many different colors, there's so many different shapes, there's totally different functions, but the health of the body is everyone is, every part is working for the health of every other part. Similarly, we have, one time I was in a college in Bombay, it was an accountancy college. And after my talk, a student came up, or he stood up, there was 800 people there, and he said, Swami, everything you said is totally useless. I reject it all. 
What if everyone in the world became a swami like you? Who would run the governments? Who would grow the food? Who would do the banking? Who would do the educating? Therefore, you are simply misleading us. He got a standing ovation. The crowd was roaring. You know how students are. They love when their teacher is challenged, at least in Bombay. <laughs> So when everyone settled down, I answered his question. I said a little prayer first. <laughs> I really needed help on this one. I said, what if everyone in the world became an accountant like you? Who would run the governments? Who would do the banking? Who would grow the food? Who would do the educating? In fact, if everyone in the world became an accountant like you, the whole world would be unemployed because no one would need an accountant. <laughs> There's a need for f politicians. There's a need for military people. There's a need for engineers and doctors and business people. There's a need for accountants. And there's some need for swamis, too. <laughs> We're all supposed to work together like the different limbs and organs of a body. And if we're all serving the whole of the body, then we have a healthy society. We need a liver. We need a heart. We need legs. It's not that one part of the body thinks I'm better than you. Everyone is respecting and honoring the work of another. There's a beautiful verse in the Srimad Bhagavat. Savai Pung Sangpuro Dharma Yatobakti Rodhokshiji Ahoitiki Apriti Hata Yayatma Suprasiditi. That the supreme occupation, the supreme Dharma for every living being is to serve with love. Such love for God and for all beings must be unmotivated by selfishness an ego and uninterrupted by temptations or fears that come upon us. We're using the analogy of the body. Let's just think of the service of our heart. The heart is pumping blood, pumping life and energy to every cell of our body. The heart serves 24 hours a day. Yes? If it were to take a vacation, <laughs> if it would take a lunch break, if it was, you know, called by the bell to go out and vote, <laughs> we would die. The heart is serving every part of the body 24 hours a day. That's service. And every part of the body is serving the heart and each other. Individually, we should take this example. The heart represents Life and love. We say, get to the heart of it. The heart is very much the essence. Why? Because the heart serves unconditionally, uninterruptedly. And from a social perspective, the government is very much like the heart of our countries. To supply, to facilitate, to encourage, and to empower the people to be the best they could be to make positive changes and contributions to the world. Like the heart, our governments and the individuals of the governments, if we really want to see true 
happiness and prosperity must be in this mood of seva or selfless service to really make the interest of the people our interest, our happiness. All over the world we see if people don't get such encouragement and such facilitation there's riots, there's demonstrations, there's upheavals. There's a beautiful verse in the Gita, yad yad evitrojana, which means the future of the world is so much dependent on the example of the leaders. In every field, in business, in industry, as we're speaking today, there's demonstrations on Wall Street because the leaders of business, instead of serving, they were exploiting. Yes, in so many ways, the government is like the heart to encourage and to empower people to do good things and to curtail those selfish elements that exploit and cause harm to any individual within this society. Spirituality in the big society. It's a very big subject. It's especially important that we can somehow or other, through our examples, communicate these values in our schools and in our educational systems. After I saw those riots in Bombay, I was thinking that in this world, people learn how to hate before they learn how to even reason. People should learn to understand the universal values of honoring life, of respecting the environment, of respecting our brothers and sisters and giving them the rights they deserve. I guess government is like being gardeners supplying water to the seeds of goodness feeding the good dog in people and to also pull the weeds of those things that are impeding the goodness and the, pros and the, the prosperity of values within the world In my own life, I saw yogis who could perform incredible, what we call miracles. I saw people stopping their hearts. I saw people just saying some mantra and producing things out of nowhere. I saw people, if you read The Journey Home, you'll learn something about what I saw people doing. They could read minds. They could live without food, but spice breathing. But you know something? After a while, I was not impressed by any of it. The only thing that really impressed me was humility, integrity, the true sense of love, which means seva in Sanskrit. the joy of serving. When I was a little boy, my mother taught me this principle. Whether she was given a pearl necklace or whether I would just grab a flower out of her garden 
and give it to her. She was equally happy. She always had tears in her eyes. And she said, it's not the thing that counts. It's the thought. It's the love that gives meaning to anything. Things are meant to be used and people are meant to be loved. But unfortunately, so many times we become so distracted that we love things and we use people. Money and power are, and knowledge are great assets when they're used with compassion. Just like a knife. Is a knife good or bad? Depends on who's holding it. A thief will use it to kill someone, and a doctor will use it to save someone's life. The power that we have from a spiritual perspective, it's a gift of God. The influence that we have, the knowledge that we have, are beautiful tools to be utilized to serve, like the heart, unconditionally, with love. In my own guru, Srila Prabhupada, I remember I was so deeply impressed. When he was 70 years old, he was on a boat 38 days across two oceans and three continents. He had no money. He didn't know anyone where he was going. And he wrote a beautiful prayer, and in that prayer he's praying to God. Just let me be a puppet. Make me dance to give happiness and joy to others. I believe it's a, it's a very beautiful concept, the big society. But all great concepts are really great when there's a mood of unselfish compassion to serve without discrimination, to truly understand the value of everyone. And in my experience in life, that really is so much the meaning of spirituality. I'm so grateful to all of you. Thank you very much. moments, but um, if, um, to take some questions, if um, anybody would like to ask any questions to his audience. Yes, yes. Uh, Somebody, the, the student who told you that all religions are actually a problem, uh, he probably meant that because uh, we have two big blocks of religions, the, the religions of India, namely Hinduism, Sikhism, Jainism which continuously said that all paths to God are valid, and so we need not fight about it. Unfortunately, the Abrahamic religions believe that they are only right, and they need to convert the whole world, uh, and they wouldn't rest till they achieve that. Now, you have two very big conflicts there. So there are Abrahamic religions fighting each other, and they are fighting the, the Dharmic religions. So what we want is a statement by the heads of religions to say all paths are really valid 
as long as you are happy with it. Until and unless we come to that situation, unfortunately, wars and killings will go on. Is that a question? <laughs> I, with your permission, I'll make a small comment. <laughs> that all paths are valid if they actually bring about good character in people. True spirituality is not simply about affiliating with one religion or another. True spirituality is about the transformation of the heart. Transforming greed into generosity, arrogance into humility, envy into appreciation of others, transforming hate into love transforming darkness into light and transforming anxiety and stress into deep fulfillment through being like that. To be an instrument of the grace that is within all of us. <clears throat> to access that grace and to live with such values and such universal character is the right path. And I feel governments, religious leaders, social leaders, mothers, fathers, educators should emphasize those values that will actually encourage us, the society, to develop character. Srila Prabhupada, my teacher, once was asked some, a philosophical question. And he said, philosophy and religion have little or no value unless they inspire good character. Transformation in the hearts of the followers. I hope that answers the question you never asked. <laughs> Thank you very much. Yeah, please. Please. Thank you for that wonderful answer. I think it's perhaps also important, I think the first speaker distinguished a little too sharply between the religions of India and the West Asian religions. And in two weeks' time, Pat Benedict is inviting representatives of all the religions to Assisi as his predecessor, Pope John Paul, did 25 years ago. Uh, and that invitation and that whole meeting is grounded and rooted in a respect for other religions. Obviously, there, are, there, are, there are a difference, obviously, between the East and West Asian religions. But I may say, I think it's more complex and more subtle than your question suggests. Sorry. If I can just say one thing before. I read something of St. Francis. I lived in Assisi many times. He's one of my greatest inspirations. Um, he spoke that we should preach always. And when necessary, sometimes, we should say something. Which means our example, our lifestyle, our character, our compassion is what will really change the world, not just our words. Thank you. Yes? Can I just ask you, uh, how, as a, as a mother, how your mother felt when you took this journey, the, the journey you took from uh, being 19 and you traveled the world, and you, you gave up Judaism, I suppose. I, mean, I don't know. Is this how does your family feel? That's the whole book's about that. I know it is. <laughs> I know it is, but I've only got I've only got a quarter of the way through yet. So okay. I just 
Okay, so well, I'll, a bit I'll give you a really, a really little concise synopsis. Okay. At least I hope that's how it comes out. <laughs> um, what can I say? I have many regrets as far as my teenage insensitivity. I can't blame being a teenager. But even our mistakes are oftentimes very growing experiences. But I, when I left America at 19 in the summer, I told my mother and father that I will be back for the next semester of college after two and a half months. They didn't want me to go. But in the 1960s, that was a detail that we didn't pay much attention to. But I promised I would be back for school. Two and a half months passed. Six weeks, seven weeks, eight weeks, nine weeks, about ten weeks later, they, heard, they had no way to communicate with me. The last time I talked to them was at a British phone booth at Piccadilly Circus. You know what one of my biggest transformations was? I was sitting in Trafalgar Square and I was so torn between what the society of the counterculture and everybody else expected of me and this calling in my heart. And then I went into the St. Martin's of the Fields and I sat and prayed and prayed and prayed for direction and then I opened a Bible that was sitting right there in front of me. And I prayed, give me directions, Lord. And I remember the words that were right in front of my eyes. Come out from among men and be separate. So I decided, I'm just going to follow my heart. Oh God, what that did to my parents. <laughs> Finally, after almost a month of not hearing anything from me, and beyond school already started and I wasn't there, they got a letter which said, I'm no longer with my friend Gary, I'm all alone now. And I decided I'm going to travel overland to India in search of truth. I've been seeing life through the windows of a Western person, now I want to see the values and the, the passions of the people of the East. What greater education could be the, there than this? I'm hitchhiking to India. They received that letter. It was postmarked Iran. There was no return address. And they got a couple letters from me in Afghanistan and then some letters of how I thought they would think I was so courageous and cool when I wrote to them that I'm living in the jungles of the Himalayas in a cave. They didn't think I was cool at all. <laughs> they were absolutely in distress. They were worrying their hearts out. And I never believed that I left Judaism. I was trying to find God, which I believe was what Judaism is and what Christianity is. I was trying to find that connection in my own way. I never wanted to betray anyone or leave anyone. I just wanted to find what I needed to find in my life. And eventually, the bell is ringing to vote or something. Yeah, thank you so much. Eventually, when I came home, I was following this bhakti path, path of devotion. I was a culture shock for them. They were a culture shock for me. But something very beautiful happened. I loved them and respected them for who they were, even though they were so different. And I really didn't believe a lot of things that they did. And they were the same thing for me. And after the shock, of the differences, 
they actually open their hearts and minds to understand the values of my life and my people. And they were coming to India and they fell in love with everything. In fact, my, my brother's Jewish, he married a Catholic girl and they were just trying to decide where to either bless or baptize their children and my mother and father said, your brother's a Swami, let him do it in a Krishna temple. <laughs> and all their grandchildren, I was doing the blessings. And when my mother passed away about five years ago, it was her wish and the wish of the whole family to do something that was, to me it was inconceivable because I had nothing to do with the decision. That they cremate their, her body and give me the ashes to bring to India because she loved what we do so much. I hope that answers your question. It does, thank you. So, can I just ask yes, of course. So, I just returned from a parliamentary visit to Bismarck, uh -huh. and um, I saw the two communities moving with hatred. The difference is it's religion rather than um, human race, basically. Can the Swamis or the spiritual leaders not have what we politicians have, G and G20, to solve our problems and address our problems? Can we not have some religious uh, leaders get together and say, this is what we have in common? These are differences because there are religious differences. But this can unite human race to, to, to a point. Would that not be a good idea to do that? I mean, we, don't, we don't hear about religious leaders getting together. I know about that. Very rarely it happened. We had <coughs> luckily a big pop down here last year, so we had <coughs> some get together, but very rarely it happens. It is my sincere, heartfelt prayer that it may happen. Everything is possible if the will is there. It's very, it's very crucial to the world because as we're progressing, it's becoming a global economy and we're all so interconnected. In America, there's so many, almost anywhere you go, there's translations into Spanish. <laughs> America's changing with so many different people. Of, it's always been different colors, different races, different languages. Britain has become like that so much. You know, when I left America in 1970, on my way to India, I had never met an Indian in my life. I had never eaten Indian food in my life. And in my case, I didn't know where India was, and I didn't have a map, but I just had faith, if I keep hitchhiking east, I'm going to get there. What a change now. You can't go anywhere in America without seeing Indians and Orientals. And <laughs> practically every software engineer, most doctors, almost every hotel is owned. Huh? The world is really changing and we can't really survive in peace unless there is tolerance and communication. And better than tolerance is actual appreciation of who we are and what we stand for. Unity and diversity. The diverse religions, the diverse races, all of these things bring beauty to the world if we actually recognize the essence within our own heart, our own tradition, and see it in others. When I was living on the bank of the Ganges 40 years ago, there was an 85-year-old man who was a Hindu named Narayan. And we would speak so many spiritual things. He taught me a lot, and his guru was teaching me. But every day, Narayan took me to see his best friend, whose name was Mohammed. He owned the Magadha X-ray clinic. This was in Patna, Bihar. And they would sit at a, from 11 o'clock to 12 o'clock every day discussing religion. 
They weren't debating, they were sharing. One spoke, Muhammad spoke from the Holy Quran, and Narayan spoke from the Bhagavad Gita and the Ramayan, and they even let me speak, whatever I was learning. And they were appreciating, they were loving, they were feeling enriched by each other's views. One day I was sitting alone with Narayan on the bank of the river. And I asked him, how is it possible in a country where there's so much communal competition and hatred between Muslims and Hindus, how is it that you two are best friends? I'll never forget his answer. I've repeated it probably thousands of times. May I tell you? He said, very simple analogy. A dog will recognize his master any way the master dresses. The master may be in a tuxedo. The master may be in t-shirt and blue jeans. The master may be in a religious garment or in bathing suit. The master may even be naked. But the dog recognizes the master because there's love. He said, if we cannot recognize our master, our Lord, when that Lord comes in different dresses at different times to different people to teach the same message, then we have so much to learn from the dogs. And he said, even our highest educational facilities in the world and our greatest religious teachers of the world should teach us to be at least what the dog is. Thank you. Yes. Just a few First of all, thank you for giving me your book at the back of the Nancy Temple. I started reading it, and your journey home from the start to when you arrived in India, I think more happened to you than 10 or 20 normal people. And as we spoke when we came in here about the time you had to run for your life, was there ever a time where you thought, I can't go on, any time at all? And also, do you still keep in contact with your friends who started the journey with you? Did you vote? I did. <laughs> I'm not going to ask you what your vote was. <laughs> yeah, there is no spirituality in voting. Or indeed the whips, I don't think. <laughs> Actually, if, if, if we're making our decision based on true compassion, then there's deep spirituality in voting, too. <laughs> um, the trials that were that I was gifted with as I was going through many of them I was just scared but after we passed through them I saw that it was a blessing I've been quoting Bhagavad Gita and Bible there's a verse in the Bible that says, Seek and ye shall find. If we seek the essence of every situation, if we're seeking the opportunity to grow internally in wisdom and to connect ourselves with the divine, with God, within our hearts, then we'll find, we'll find an opportunity there. Wisdom is to transform Curses into blessings, <clears throat> challenges into opportunities. It's just a matter of how we interpret it. And because in those days I was just so eager to learn that I can tell you honestly, sometimes I would really think when I was in a life-threatening situation, what am I doing here? Why don't I go home? 
but there was something within my heart that was beyond me, a calling, that just kept pulling me forward. It was what I considered at the time the mysterious hand of destiny. And I believed it was the hand of God pulling me forward and putting me through beautiful situations that seemed so ugly that perhaps if I didn't go through those things, you were talking about a normal person, I would not be as abnormal as I am today. <laughs> but whatever situation of life is purifying, if we're really seeking the opportunity to come closer to God, to become a better instrument of compassion to the world, and to grow in that way. And I think that's a lesson that can be applied by everyone in every situation. As far as my friend, that's very much the story of the book. But if you want me to go beyond the end of the book, I just spoke to him on the phone a week ago, and I was with him about a month ago. And I'm going to tell you about this friend, really short, because it's the actual explanation of the relationship between this, my friend and my parents and me is in a 360-page book or something. We were both on a spiritual search together. Somehow or other, mystically, we would leave each other. Mystically, we would meet each other. We hadn't seen each other or had any communication for 18 years. We had no idea how to reach each other. And mystically, we met. I was just a skinny little swami, as you see me today. And he was skinnier, thinner than me, with long hair and a beard when I left him. Now, it was like his muscles were like mountains. His body was like gigantic. And I thought, he looked at me, and I looked at him, and I remember he said, I don't know what we have in common anymore. He became a physical trainer for bodybuilding at the Malibu Gym in Malibu Beach, California. <laughs> and I'm a Swami monk. And he asked me, Gary, one day, in fact, it's interesting, we were in the Baha'i Temple when he asked me this. <laughs> he asked me, how could we be friends? We're totally opposite. He said, my whole life is to convince people if they have strong, beautiful, healthy bodies, they'll be happy. And your whole life is telling people that they're not their bodies that they're an eternal soul within the body, seeing through the eyes, hearing through the ears, tasting through the tongue, loving through the heart, thinking through the brain. You're teaching people they're not the body, and my life is to teach them <coughs> to be happy with the body. So I thought about it for a second. And I said, Gary, in the tradition that I learn, We believe that the body is a temple of God. And we are the little part of God that's living within the temple. And if we use this body and use this mind for seva, for selfless service, then the body becomes an invaluable, incredibly precious instrument of our spirituality. It's the medium between us. I said, so my friend Gary, you teach people how to keep their temple really nice, 
and I'll try to teach them what to do inside, and we'll be a team. <laughs> and believe it or not, we've actually been a team ever since. Thank you. Um, we don't have any more time, but uh, we are nearing, nearing the end. I'd like to invite our final host, Matthew Offord, to say a few words of thanks. Matthew. I thank all of you so very, very much. I, I, I'm speech, even though I'm speechless, I'm speaking. <laughs> but my heart is flooded with gratitude for all of you to be here with us today. Thank you. Your Holiness. Lords, ladies and gentlemen, my fellow colleagues, I apologize for the interruption of the, of the vote, um, but as I said, it's something that we, we have to obey within the Palace of Westminster. I think many of us MPs are envious that James Clapson has the back teeth down to manor within his constituency. <laughs> but uh, I believe that spirituality doesn't respect constituency boundaries. And so it does actually pass over to places like my own in Hendon and to some other of my parliamentary colleagues who have been here earlier. And we are very grateful for that. We are very grateful for that feeling, that ethos and that sense of spirituality, which I certainly believe the big society very much needs and is the foundation of that idea. So I'm very grateful for the speech that you've given today. We hear many speeches in the House of Commons and the Houses of Parliament, and I have to say I genuinely believe that that is one of the best that we've heard and something that is very inspiring to myself. <laughs> I know that we all very much have enjoyed what we've heard, and I'm sure that many people will also enjoy reading the book, as I, I know I will as well. But I want to conclude by thanking everyone who came along today we're very grateful that you came to the Houses of Parliament, your Houses of Parliament, to talk about spirituality with His Holiness and also with each other here tonight. And I understand that we can continue for a few minutes after we conclude the proceedings. So thank you very much. I'd like to uh, thank uh, Matthew and uh, just as he was speaking, um, our third host had arrived just in the nick of time, uh, Richard Harrington MP. So Richard, um, we'd love you to say just a few words, just um, as a sort of final word. Well, I, well I'm, first of all, it's a great honour to be here and a very great honour to meet you, um, having heard so much about you, and to apologise for my non-appearance of something that I kindly agreed to host. And that's because I've been in the bill committee next door and I could not get permission to leave. And we've had two votes. But I'm very pleased to have made it in the, absolutely the last second. And I hope the arrangements went well today. And I look forward to hearing about it from my colleagues. But from my own point of view, being Member of Parliament for Watford and being so close to the manor, um, I am a regular visitor to it. Constituents at the beginning introduced it to me when I was still a candidate. And um, it's very much an important part of my life. And, um, I can't quite claim it's in the constituency, but my good friend James Clapperson can, and he, he, we have an unofficial agreement that he, he lends the manor to me when I say that it's in my constituency. Um, and um, I would very much look forward to reading the book that is there, and uh, I'm looking forward to hearing from my colleagues everything that was said. And um, it's a fantastic turnout. And, uh, Mine is what they call in the film business a cameo appearance. But um, <laughs> it's, um, I, I was here, my heart was here, if my body in fact was next door. Thank you very much indeed. I'd like to um, ask His Holiness to present um, the journey home to our hosts, um, James Clapperson. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, it's been fantastic. Thank you so much indeed. It's a great time. Uh, Matthew Offit. Thank you very much. Thank you for your speech. I look forward to reading the book as well.
That's fine. Thank you. Yes. Well, I'm afraid. No, thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. And Richard Harrington. Thank you very much. I understand that the Members of Parliament would like to present. Um, yeah. Well, it's a very, it's a, it's a very great pleasure. Yeah, no, it's, it's a very great pleasure. I know everybody here will have found universal truth in what you've told us this evening. We will all take something away from it. I know that I will be reflecting on it for some time to come. Uh, it has been a very great privilege. We've come here as humble students, and if I may say as a humble student, I think I've learnt something very important this evening. Thank you very much for joining us here. <laughs> The, sorry, the gift. No, I should. I should, I should mention this. This, this is. We, we, we felt this was was. Um, it was important to take something away which belonged to Parliament. This is a collection of great speeches which have been made in the House of Commons in the recent past. But this, this, this is something which we thought was um, of the House of Commons and a, 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 a reflection of it. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> Thank you very much indeed. Thank you. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, this now concludes uh, this evening. And I'd like to again thank you all, um, His Holiness, and indeed the members of Parliament. Would love to meet you individually. So we have a few moments uh, after uh, the conclusion. Uh, so please do come and meet the members of Parliament and His Holiness. And uh, we are, in fact, uh, giving out um, the journey home uh, just outside as you, as you leave. So. Um, again, we're very, very grateful, and uh, we'd like to thank uh, all the MPs, uh, the hosts, and of course the owners. Thank you.